I'm Charlotte McLeod with the Investing News Network, and here today with me is Steve St. Angelo, independent researcher at the SRS Rock Report. Thank you so much for joining me online today once again. It's always great to have you here. Carol, thanks for inviting me. Yeah, we're having some very interesting uh, dynamics in the, in the, with energy now, so there's plenty to talk about. Yes, there is a lot for us to get through today. And just to start off, I wondered if you could start off with a quick review of a couple of your key ideas, just for anybody who isn't familiar with you. So one thing that you talk frequently about is the approaching energy cliff. So I wondered if you could give us an idea of what that means just as we get started. Sure. Uh, the issue is the resources of the world and, and, the, and the energy is the main driver of the economy. And when you don't have uh, energy, you don't have an economy and you can't mine precious metals. So it, it's uh, energy is the number one factor that that allows uh, economic growth. And so when you understand that the resources are limited. And so the issue is we have used uh, a lot of debt in the world to bring on let's say unconventional oil production that may have not have been profitable like shale oil. And so what's happened is by accessing debt, we have added more oil. We have actually increased the amount of oil that we can produce. But what happens when you do that, you have pulled production forward. And so now when you start going over the downside of the production curve, it's not like a, it's not like a, like a, a pyramid or let's say a regular triangle, it's more like a Seneca cliff. And unfortunately, that's exactly what where we're headed. And with, with that being the case, it's going to drastically change the world as we know it, as especially the investments that we are used to investing in. And that's why it's important to understand what's happening with energy. Okay, thank you for that explanation. Now, when we've spoken before, you're very focused on what's going on with energy. And I think, you know, it hasn't necessarily been at a high level of concern for some of the other people in the world. But now things, at least I sense that they're starting to change a little bit. And one thing that's getting hard to ignore is rising oil prices. So I wondered if we could talk a little bit about that. Maybe you could explain why we're seeing that increase and if you expect it to continue and to what extent. Yes, uh, the reason why, Charlotte, we had the big increase in the price of oil in 2008 was due to the peak of conventional oil production that started in 2005. And so what happened was we were reaching uh, the peak of this conventional oil production. And then all of a sudden the price shot up over to $140, $145. And then it crashed six months later. And then it started going back up. And then we had the high oil price which brought on uh, unconventional. And so now it seems as if the world is now getting ready to peak in the unconventional. And so the, before the pandemic, the world was producing a little more than 100 million barrels of oil production per day. We had the big shutdown during the pandemic, and now the world's producers in the Middle East and elsewhere are trying to bring this production back online, but it seems like they're having difficulty. And so uh, we may see more production growth, but we're, we're not going to see the production growth that we had from 2008 since the last financial crisis to 2020. And most of that production growth, and there's a chart, most of that production growth, 82% of it was from the United States. And that was the shale industry. And unfortunately, the shale industry declines about 48 to 50% a year. So that's a, that's a very high decline rate. And the, the, the world loses about 6 to 7 to 8% a year, where the U.S. is losing 50% a year. So it takes a lot of capital to continue producing this oil. So that's the reason why we're seeing much higher oil prices. Uh, shale, the U.S. shale production may continue to increase for a while, but even the Permium, which is the last growth field in the United States, that is likely going to peak here within the next year or two. And I forecast that by 2030, we're going to see a substantial decline in U.S. shale oil production. And so when we understand that the U.S. shale was the growth 
in the last decade. We're not going to have that this decade. Then traders are, tr are starting to figure that out. And we're seeing this take place. I call it the energy cliff because people need to look at the energy st storage levels around the world, whether it's natural gas, whether it's oil. And you're noticing that they're declining, even though throughout the year, like in Europe, they can go up and down. Uh, natural gas inventories will fluctuate during the seasons. But if, if they continue to trend lower, that means we have reached this, the, I call it the energy cliff or peak of production of not only oil, but of also natural gas and likely coal soon thereafter. Okay. And, you know, you're talking about what's going to be happening in 2030. One thing you started to explain to me just before we started this interview is some people see this upcoming decade as perhaps being another roaring 20s. You don't have that opinion. So maybe you could go into that and explain what you're seeing there as well. Yeah, I have a chart because uh, there's this idea by the, uh, the the techie people now, we're, we're going to EVs and, and green energy and, and cryptos and Bitcoin. And basically, I hear a lot of the analysis that Bitcoin is going to solve all our problems. If that was, that'd be great if it really did. Unfortunately, I, I think high technology is going to get into serious trouble because high technology is a massive consumer of energy. So when you say we're going to use more technology, basically what you're saying, we're going to use more energy. And when energy gets into trouble, so it will technology. And there's a chart that I have showing U.S. oil production by decade from 1910s to, to 2010s. And we could see from 1910s to 1920s, oil production in the United States increased 154% to 2 million barrels of oil production per day. And we have to realize in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, the U.S. was the Saudi Arabia of the world. In 1940, the United States was producing 70% of all the oil in the world. So if we look at the little table in the chart, it shows the global car production. In 1924, the, the U.S. was about 3.6 million cars, vehicles. This is in thousands. In 1928, it was 4.3 million. The rest of the world was produced 10 to 15% of the cars that the United States produced. So when you brought all this oil on, we had all these vehicles. And when you have all these vehicles, Charlotte, you need roads, you need hotels, you need restaurants, you need all this supply infrastructure. So the roaring 20s was due to the massive increase in oil. It wasn't uh, American ingenuity. Uh, if you didn't have the oil, it wouldn't matter how ingenious you were, you wouldn't have had the roaring 20s. And unfortunately, what I see taking place this decade, we're not going to have a large increase in oil production. So unfortunately, it's not. we're not going to have another roaring 20s. Uh, I think actually we're going to start by 2025. That's my year when we, the world is going to start moving, start going over the energy cliff. So it's going to be actually much different than most people realize. Yeah, and we'll talk in a moment about what that post energy cliff worldwide might look like. Before we go there, you started to talk about natural gas. And I think this is another thing that's getting a little bit hard to ignore. We've seen in Europe, some supply of energy problems over there. And I think that's related to natural gas. So I wondered if you could talk about what we're seeing over there and maybe because this is topical, a little bit about the Russia-Ukraine situation and if that might have an impact as well. There's three dynamics taking place, Charlotte. Uh, and I've got a chart the one the most important dynamic is the weakest link in the world is Europe when it comes to natural gas. Because when you look at their production minus their consumption, they, they need to import the most natural gas as a region compared to the rest of the world. And according to the data in 2019, it was almost 31 billion cubic feet a day that Europe was relying upon. Uh, Asia, Pacific, which a lot of that is China, comes in second at 19 billion cubic feet a day. And where are they getting most of that natural gas? Actually, some of it from North America, most of it from Russia, which Russia is the biggest surplus 
of, of natural gas. That's why they export a lot of it. So the second issue is that they have been moving away from uh, coal and nuclear, and they're adding wind and solar. That works only if wind isn't intermittent and wind was very intermittent last year. And they had a very cold winter and wind underperformed in the summer. So they had very low inventories going into the winter this year. And now they're at record low levels. A year ago, they were at 42% where they should be. This year, they're at 32%. And, and so now this is the problem. Europe is getting their, their inventories of natural gas are falling. And we have to understand, even though Russia, there's this Ukraine issue, Russia is still sending all the long-term contracts of natural gas to Europe. They, 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 they sent every bit of that. What they aren't sending to them is what's left over, and they're sending it to the highest bidder. And that is in Asia right now and in other places. So other places are outbidding Europe. That's why they're not getting as much natural gas. And lastly, the world is consuming so much of this energy now, especially China. Everyone wants more natural gas. There's just not enough of it. And so again, when you look at Europe, Europe is the weakest link. And they're the ones that, that are going to get into trouble first. But as time goes on, Charlotte, I see more and more countries get into trouble with natural gas because we have transitioned away from coal and nuclear, which were very stable. And now we're moving more towards, I call just-in-time energy production, which is natural gas, wind, and solar. And when wind and solar don't work as well as they're supposed to, when the wind stops blowing and the sun stops shining, you have to use natural gas to balance it. And that only works when you can continue to increase natural gas production. And so this is another issue that the world is going to be facing as we move forward. And I don't think they're prepared for it. Yeah, this is certainly very, very important. It's something that we're going to be needing to keep an eye on to see if those things keep happening elsewhere. You've, you've started telling us, you know, how the approaching energy cliff is not good news for the economy. I think that's pretty clear to see. When we spoke about a year ago, you are also saying you're expecting a correction in the broader market. So I wanted to check in with you on that and see where we're at with that right now. Charlotte, it seems as if the uh, the markets, uh, the, the options trading, and that's a lot of due to retail investors that have moved into the markets uh, since the pandemic shut down. Uh, and so what, there's a lot of retail investment. There's a lot of you know, it's, there's record margin debt. And so speculation can go on longer than we realize. And that's one of these things. The market isn't really based on fundamentals anymore. And there's a lot of different technical indicators like the, the Buffin Index and, you know, the debt to GDP and all these different things we can look at and, uh, that the, the markets are extremely overvalued, but they can continue to be overvalued until something finally happens. And I think we had all the stimulus in 2020 and in 2021. We're not, we're not getting that in 2022. So I still believe we're in for a somewhat of a disinflationary outcome. And that means sell off in the markets. That means lower energy prices. That means lower metals prices. I still think that's coming, even though it seems to be taking longer but when that happens, the energy cliff problems come back to haunt us again, and then the inflation comes back. It's actually less to do with money printing and more to do with the uh, problems and, and, the, and the energy scarcity and how it, we could see it in Europe. High energy prices are making fertilizer, food, everything's going up there. Well, so I do think we get a disinflationary wave uh, over the next two, three quarters. And then after that into 2023 and 2024, the problems with energy scarcity are just going to uh, impact the markets. And then we never know what the Fed and central banks are going to do. So I do, I, th I do think we're going to see much higher inflation in the future as well. And both in, in energy, food, and metals, metals prices. 
Yeah, and let's talk a little bit about the metals prices, specifically gold and silver, because we know, as you've been saying, troubles with energy should lead to much higher prices for metals like gold and silver. So what do you see in terms of prices either in this year or if you want to look a little bit forward, that's fine too. In, in, if, we, if we do get the disinflationary wave, and again, I always, because I, I don't know, I, I don't know. Uh, it, it, and on, on another thing, if we look at the gold COT report, the commercials are still very net short gold. And I would imagine since the last price rise this week, they're going to be even a larger amount of commercial net short positions. So if that continues to be an indicator, usually we're going to see a sell-off. So if we get the disinflationary wave, I see gold and silver prices weakening by the end of this year. And then Again, as the energy problems, the energy cliff comes back to haunt us again in the next, in 2023 and 2024, or a resumption in the Fed and central bank uh, po uh, QE policies, then we're going to see uh, the next move higher in the metals. And so that's, and what we need to understand, and I've got a chart here, two dynamics are gonna be taking place. They're gonna be energy scarcity, but that's going to impact negatively the value of most stocks, bonds, and real estate because GDP is based on oil production growth. And if you no longer have oil production growth, you no longer have rising GDP, you, you start having less economic activity, which means more unemployment, which means less people to afford things too. So there's another dynamic that the world has really never faced before. And so I think as a, a, my analysis suggests that as we go over the energy cliff, the best stores of energy value, if the, if the most important factor is energy in our economy, is gold and silver because they are stores of this energy value. Stocks, bonds, and real estate are, I call them energy IOUs. So I see their values. You have to remember a stock price is based on earnings. So if the GDP and the economic activity is falling, their earnings are going to fall. If their earnings are going to fall, the stock price is going to fall. And this is the same thing with the bond. And this is the same thing with real estate. And so that's why I'm a very big believer in, in, the, in the precious metals due to the energy problems, disregarding whatever the Fed and central banks do, because at some point in time, they're going to lose control. And that's when I see a lot of investors and even institutions move into gold and silver in, in, a, in a much larger way. Yeah, it's very clear how gold and silver could be helpful in preparing for these scenarios that you're mapping out for us. I wondered if there are any other tactics that you're using aside from gold and silver. Is there anything else you're looking at? Uh, you know, there's a, a, a diamonds are another investment potential because they are uh, they're rare. They uh, I mean, like you, you, it's like you can put. 80, 80 uh, ounces of silver in your pocket compared to one ounce of gold, and you could put a fraction, a fraction of an ounce of diamonds compared to many ounces of gold in your pocket. So diamonds may also be another hard asset to protect wealth in the future because there's only so many diamonds and diamond mining is also going to peak and decline. But I think the issue we saw during the pandemic, Charlotte, is there was people I call it the exodus from the big city because the lockdowns, people said, I, I got to get out of the big city. We saw this in Europe. We saw this in, in major cities in the United States. So people, they moved, they started buying real estate uh, out in the suburbs. Well, I think this is going to continue as the energy cliff gets worse. I think it's, we're going to see people move to the rural areas or, or let's say outside the suburbs to modest homes in the country. I believe real estate values are gonna decline. Most real estate values, commercial, suburban, residential real estate, warehouse real estate, all that real estate overall is going to lose value. Where I see it holding value and increasing in value are real estate homes in the country because there's not that many of them. Most of the world has moved urban. And unfortunately, I hate to be a bearer, a party pooper, but 
when we go to a new energy scarcity, that's our, 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 our new economy, the urban areas and suburban areas, dense suburban areas are going to be very problematic. And so that is where I see uh, people either looking to invest in or moving to in the future. And I think that's going to increase as time goes on. But I, I do see a, a mass exodus, especially in the of later, later five years of this decade into 2030. Okay, that's very interesting. As we're, as we're finishing up here, I promised we would go back to the question of what a post-energy cliff world looks like. So I wondered if you could go into that. I think it might be perhaps the most important question that we address today. Yes, you know what's interesting? Uh, we have a very high functioning, interwoven global supply chain. And we hear that now. Uh, we hear like problems with the supply chain. Uh, getting semiconductors uh, and other other things now, uh, and because natural gas was in such such short supply, and at a high price, the Romanian fertilizer, the largest uh, fertilizer producer in Romania, shut down in December 17th, and they have not reopened. So, these are the issues you get when you start hitting energy scarcity, and this is nothing new. We've, the world has experienced this many times over, but with different energy sources. And I have a chart comparing, I did a, uh, a video, extensive video on the late Bronze Age, which was about 1700 BC to 1200 BC. And not many people understand it, but it was actually globalized. It was a global economy for its time for its its the, the civilizations which is egypt which was the mycenaeans in greece the babylonians they were it was the bronze age so they were trading copper and tin to make bronze and what was the major fuel source back then was fuel they cut down hundreds of millions and i even say during their ancient roman empire during the peak in 50 years they cut down a billion trees to make charcoal, to smelt metal. And that's the way we've been smelting metals up until about the 1800s when we started using coal. And so what happened with the late Bronze Age, in just 50 years, it collapsed because it was highly dependent upon tin that was coming from Afghanistan, which was thousands of miles away. So the, the modern global economies get their energies, oil, natural gas, and coal. Let's forget renewables. They don't even really matter. Unfortunately, they don't. And then, of course, the base metals, rare earth, minerals, and lithium, these are supposedly powering the new modern economy. But the semiconductor industry is, I call it, it's, the, the, uh, let's say, the big fab plants that are being built to produce these, these semiconductors. They need a long supply chain. So they're only a head of a very long snake. And there's thousands of companies that, that provide tools and materials, specialized gases to make a semiconductor possible. And when the, when the global supply chain starts to break down, it's going to be very difficult to make a semiconductor because it's so we're so interwoven. And I believe this is one of the most major misunderstood aspects about our global economy. It's working now, but in the future, when we get more disruptions, as we, we're just getting a hint of that now, as that becomes even more problematic, it's going to be difficult to replace high-tech servers like banking servers that run the banking industry, the Bitcoin miners, they're replaced every two years. They consume a lot of semiconductors. So when you understand that high tech works, works because you're burning a lot of energy, and when you start getting into trouble with energy, high tech gets into serious trouble. So unfortunately, a lot of people are not prepared for this because they have no idea what's happening with energy. And unfortunately, I think this, I, I see so many people talking about this how we're going to move toward Jetsons, a cartoon Jetsons flying cars. And on, I see just the opposite. I see a remake of the late Bronze Age, ancient Roman Empire, Mayan Empire, because we've reached the peak of the energy return on investment. And it is what it is. And, and so how this plays out, it could be quick. 
it could be slow, but it's going to be very disruptive, unfortunately, for, for the, the globe and for all the people in, in the world. Okay, well, as always, you've left us with a lot to think about. I think we can wrap it up there. Unless you have anything you want to add, maybe if you want to let people know where they can find you, just any final words. They can go to the srsrockreport.com website. Uh, I've got uh, sub subscription-based material for uh, where I provide the details. And then I, I also uh, SRS Rock Report on Twitter. But again, the one thing that your followers should be looking at is is checking what's happening with the storage levels of energy in the world, whether it's in China or Asia or Europe or US, uh, wherever those, if, if those levels continue to decline, that's the buffer. That's the buffer that we use. If that buffer begins to disappear, when it really disappears, the volatility that we're going to see is going to be, it's, that's, it's going to be off the charts. And it's very difficult to run an economy on highly volatile prices. It's very disruptive. So that's one very important factor that I believe people need to keep an eye on. And I do appreciate your time uh, discussing these very important but overlooked issues. Well, and of course, we appreciate your time, too. Thank you so much for, for being here once again. Thank you very much. All right. And I'm Charlotte McLeod with the Investing News Network, and this is Steve St. Angelo with the SRS Rock Report.